The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 10114 in the name of Roderick Campbell on Scotland's secret bunker reopening. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Mr Campbell, uh, seven minutes please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If I may, I would like everybody to briefly imagine what the world would have been like had certain events in history taken a different turn. What if the Cuban Missile Crisis, and specifically the boats of the Soviet Union that carried intercontinental ballistic missiles, had taken a different turn in 1962? What if tensions between India and Pakistan had escalated further than any of us dare imagine? And what if the world, instead of peacefully retreating from the Cold War, had engaged in nuclear war? For years, we knew the world was prepared for nuclear war, but only since the end of the Cold War have we learned just how prepared we were. Whilst the British government might have had the capacity to order a nuclear strike, it is only in recent decades that we have learned exactly how they would have operated in underground facilities such as Scotland's secret bunker at Troywood near Anstruther. In addition to Troywood, we now know there were bunkers at Barnton Quarry near Edinburgh and at Coulty Braggan near Cymru. A vast number remain unknown or unopened to the public, making Scotland's secret bunker, for the moment, an unrivalled tourist attraction in Scotland. Situated 100 feet underground, the bunker hosts 24,000 square feet of accommodation that would have become home to members of the British Government, specifically the Secretary of State and Minister of State for Scotland, had the country been subjected to nuclear strikes. A three-tonne blast door at the end of a 150-metre tunnel secluded underneath an ordinary-looking farmhouse in rural North East Fife hosts what would have been the command centre and living quarters of what were considered essential personnel in Scotland. This would have included, in the past, such people as Secretary of States Arthur Woodburn, Willie Ross, and more recently Malcolm Rifkind, in a room including no less than a substantial box of King Edward cigars. Other bunker inhabitants would have included up to 300 other personnel, including civil servants and members of the emergency services. With concrete up to three metres thick, reinforced by inch-thick tungsten rods every 15 centimetres, there is a peculiar irony to watching public information messages inside the museum that inform people how to turn their homes into fallout shelters by using dining tables and sofa cushions if they couldn't access the more luxurious and sturdy options of sandbags and planks of wood. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the opening of the bunker as a tourist attraction following an extensive refurbishment which has included opening access to previously unseen areas of the bunker. James Mitchell, owner of the bunker, as well as the Barnton Quarry nuclear bun bunker, recently said its reopening would, quote, help bring the bunker back to life for visitors, following investment in a series of information screens throughout the museum that will soon go live. He's also spoken of how the bunker shows just how recent and real the threat was and just how prepared we were. Initially serving as an early warning radar station to warn of an attack from the USSR, the R3-type bunker was built in 1951 and used by the RAF as a rotor station between 1953 and 1956. And when that technology became redundant, the MOD mothballed the site for two years before the Civil Defence Corps moved in between 1956 and 1968. After the withdrawal of the Corps, the MOD established Troywood, as the bunker is known, as a regional government headquarters before it was finally decommissioned in 1993. The bunker is therefore different from the Culty Braggen bunker, which was completed in 1990 specifically for the purpose of being a nuclear shelter. Obviously, the RAF, Civil Defence Corps and the Royal Observer Corps all occupied the bunker at one time or another at Troywood, and the ROC in particular had a long, distinguished history it was therefore with anger and disappointment that Air Commodore GM Body announced the standing down of the ROC in September 1991. I would share the comments made by James Mitchell in, real in relation to the reality of the risk that once faced not just this country but the world. But having visited the bunker, it's remarkable to see just what preparations were in place and just how seriously the world took the concept of mutually assured destruction during the Cold War. 
As an example, a previously classified document from the Joint Intelligence Committee in 1967 is on display. It notes that in Fife, Pitt Reevy, Rosyth, RAF Lucas and Troywood were four potential targets for the USSR. The committee suggested that an attack on Troywood alone would require four one megaton bombs and to destroy all four targets would require 12 0.5 or one megaton bombs which would have been the equivalent of dropping 1100 Hiroshima bombs. More frightening is the approximation that a one megaton strike on Torness power station would have rendered Fife and the Lothians uninhabitable for centuries. Interestingly, Scotland's secret bunker isn't the only bunker that has opened as a tourist attraction, and there are plans to open the Barnton Quarry Bunker in the near future. And there are, of course, similar tourist destinations in England. Culty Braggen, on the other hand, will remain used for data storage. Hosting tens of thousands of tourists every year, I'm delighted that Scotland's Secret Bunker has thrown open its blast-proof doors to the public for the 20th year in succession. And even after all this time, it's still able to unearth new treasures of interest. There's more that still can be uncovered, and the museum is always on the lookout for any information or loans of materials that could be used in their displays. That said, it's interesting to note that there are doors in the museum that are still sealed off to the public, because what lies behind them is classified under the Official Secrets Act. They're so well sealed off that even the cat flap for the resident cat, Cleo, cannot be opened. And uh, the museum also contains a, a cafe, which is certainly atmospheric, uh, has the feel of the 50s and 60s, down to the music of Kitty Lester and Jim Reeves, which, when I was there with somewhat younger members of uh, of the public, uh, they had no, no idea who either Kitty Lester or Jim Rees were. Time moves on. But I think that, that the thought of nuclear war is, I believe, so alien to many born after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the dissolution of the USSR that it resembles more closely the script from video games such as the Call of Duty than it does the real world. Times have changed, but the bunker has even played host to weddings since July 1994. Artifacts, for that is what they now are, such as Scotland's secret bunker, serve as a valuable reminder that the world balanced precariously close to nuclear disaster. Not only that, but the world was prepared for nuclear disaster. Mercifully, Troywood was never used for its intended purpose. I hope that the upgrades have made the secret bunker museum will um, help it to boost its tourist numbers this season and in the seasons going forward, and it will continue to serve as one of the most fascinating uh, premier attractions in North East Fife. To those of you who have not been there, I think it's well worth a visit. Uh, and I thank uh, you all for, the, for staying for this debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Alex Rowley to be followed by Graham Day. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, and I would want to congratulate Roderick Campbell for securing uh, this, this motion uh, and debate tonight. Um, in terms of the, 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 the bunker itself, I would also want to congratulate James Mitchell and indeed everyone that's been involved in putting in their time, their resources um, to the, restoring the bunker and, and bringing it into being a major visitor attraction, not just for five, but indeed for the whole of Scotland. I certainly look forward to visiting uh, this attraction and to looking at what has been, been achieved there and what can be learned. because. Um, the UCICT um, as, as, as a tool for getting across um, history and, and being able to engage young people um, and looking at the, the, the history that, that surrounds this particular bunker is something that I'm certainly very interested in. And I know that other visitor attractions in Fife uh, who want to try and update the, 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 the tools that they use to try and get their, their, their message across. So I look forward to that. Um, as, 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 um, as Roderick has said, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis and, 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 and such events uh, are very much in history, but we can learn so much and perhaps tell us so much in terms of trying to look forward uh, to what kind of world it is. Personally, I've, I've always campaigned and believe in multilateral disarmament, and I think that we have made progress in that area, um, and, and those are the policies that we need to continue to take forward. But certainly, the history of the bunker, um, I think, is important in terms of looking at the lessons of how we do move forward. 
I also welcome the investment and the, the reopening of this bunker, this major tourist attraction, as I say, not just for Fife, for Scotland, because Fife um, is some place that, that is, is, is good to visit, some place that's good to stay. We have a whole load of facilities and resources. People sometimes associate tourism in Fife with St. St. Andrews and, and the, the, the northeast of Fife. And while this, this um, bunker in the East Nuke um, will be a welcome contribution to what's available in northeast Fife, as soon as you cross that bridge, you are into a, a major sort of tourist um, um, capital, a kingdom, um, and, and, and there is so much. Count Fife now is attracting more outdoor visitors um, than most parts of Scotland. Um, Lahore Meadows, which is based in my own constituency, the country park there, um, is, is a major visit attraction with over 460,000 um, visits per year. The Coast and Countryside Trust um, who now maintain the Fife Coastal Path, and you could kick off uh, King Carden and walk right up and visit the bunker when you're on your way. And the key point that I've always made about all these uh, tourist attractions is that how do we ensure that we actually maximise the opportunities that are there? If you look at the economic strategy for Fife, Tourism in the sector, tourism sector, is a really important sector. But we've got to look at how we maximise the opportunities, encourage the developments and investment, such as the bunker, and congratulate people for doing that. But actually ensuring that we be able to pull all these attractions together and look at how tourism becomes truly a key part of the Fife economy, um, offering opportunities through training, skills development, and, and jobs at the end of the day, um, and, and encouraging small, medium enterprises to set up as well and take advantage of the opportunities that attract more people into Fife. It's also important that we link up with um, our neighbours. I'm, I'm a big fan of the city region agenda, and in the summertime, for example, um, Edinburgh colleagues in Edinburgh tell me, and Edinburgh Council, when I've met with them in the past, that, that they are keen to see more opportunities for people to visit a much wider area than just the city itself. Um, and, and this, this addition, the, the bunker itself, will be a very welcome addition as a visit attraction. But we need to ensure that we link up so that the councils in Fife, Edinburgh and others are, are actually working together to ensure that, that the wider city region and the beauty of Fife is part of the, the, the visit attraction that people actually get when they come to Scotland. So, so I'm winding up, I congratulate um, Roderick Campbell for bringing this motion forward, the, the, the debate and, and securing this debate. I certainly congratulate all, these, all those that have been involved in putting this, this great visit attraction together and Mr. welcome Close. it on behalf of Fife. Many thanks. Now call on Graham Day to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Four minutes or thereby, yeah, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the, the notion of promoting secret bunkers is one which I, I must admit causes me a degree of amusement. It may say much about my personality, but I never cease to be tickled by a, a van I invariably come across when journeying to and from Parliament when I'm here in Edinburgh. There it sits emblazoned with promotional details of the secret bunker, indicating, amongst other things, that it's located near St Andrews. And I think, well, ain't much of a secret anymore, is it? But as I said, Presiding Officer, that, that's maybe just Something about, say something about my view of the world, and Lord knows any source of humour to be found around the Easter Road area of Edinburgh these days is to be welcomed. In all seriousness, though, I, I want to uh, congratulate uh, Rod Campbell on securing this debate on the secret bunker at Ansara because it, it highlights an important issue, and that is bringing to the attention of younger people just what's out there for them to visit and educating them in a way that resonates. Scotland has its castles, its nature reserves, its museums, its galleries, and many of us marvel at those, but when you're a kid, you really want something a bit different, something which chimes with your world. I was reminded of this uh, just last Monday when I helped host a, a visit to Parliament by a group of uh, young pupils from Inverbrothic Primary School in Arbroath. It turned out that trip to Edinburgh had also involved stopping off at Dynamic Earth. I asked one of the youngsters which part of their day had been best, and as we know, kids tend not to be overly diplomatic. 
Um, although Rod Campbell's constituency and mine are separated by the River Tay, people from each will travel to the other for a day out. And in between the two, if you're a youngster, there's the great stopping off point in the shape of the Dundee Science Centre. Actually, if you're an adult, it's a great stopping off point too. I, I certainly enjoyed my visit there. These attractions, such as the Science Centre and the Secret Bunker, are not only a fun day out, but they're also educational and they provide children with information in a fashion that won't be forgotten in a hurry. And that matters. So often children are bored by sterile presentation of history, but bring it to life and they'll engage. And it's so important that children learn about events such as the Cold War so that they understand where we've come from and, quite frankly, the dangers posed by still having nuclear weapons in the world. We should all of us, of course, be thankful that these nuclear bunkers never had to be used for their intended purpose. And let's welcome the fact also that many of the 1,600 or so nuclear monitoring posts which were established are now being put to useful use. A peaceful use, rather. Not only have some, such as Troy Wood, uh, been turned into educational resources, bunkers throughout Scotland have found other different uses. The bunker under Carruthers House in Dunfries has been used multiple times in emergencies, including during the 1988 Lockerbie disaster, in 2001 during the foot and mouth crisis, and for contingency planning when bad weather has hit in recent years. The bunker at Rake Moor in the Highlands has been used to coordinate responses for numerous disasters, such as flash flooding in 2002 and 2010, when a container holding detonators exploded in Inverness. So those old bunkers have proved their worth over the decades, although not in their intended manner, and we should all be grateful for that, of course. Despite 1,600 of these monitoring rooms being built, I haven't been able to find any evidence of one in my constituency. That might be because it's still a secret, of course. But whether it's through acting as a museum or a control room for emergencies, it's good to see these facilities being put to some productive use. And I particularly welcome examples of them becoming tourism attractions. In an increasingly competitive market in which Scotland is hindered by not being able to look at reducing APD and VAT on tourism, we need every advantage we can muster to entice visitors here. North East Fife, like Angus, is its top drawer, golf, heritage and scenery attractions, and with a V&A to come in between the two areas. But things like uh, the, the secret bunker are that little bit different, off, offer that wee bit of novelty and help ensure Scotland stands out from the crowd. While the secret bunker may not be so secret now, it's certainly special. And I'd like to congratulate it on its reopening and once again thank Rod Campbell on securing this debate. Thank you. Very much. I now call on Murdo Fraser, after which we'll move to the closing speech from the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I uh, join with others in uh, congratulating Roderick Campbell uh, on his motion and for securing the debate uh, this evening. Uh, Scotland has many great visitor attractions, but has only one secret bunker currently open to the public. Uh, and a bit like uh, Graham Day's uh, wry amusement at the publicity around the uh, secret bunker, I always think it's one of life's great ironies that as you drive up the M90 uh, motorway through Fife, a journey I make several times a week, you see the signs to the secret bunker, which is uh, obviously not so secret after all. But for 20 years, as, as Rod Campbell pointed out, the secret bunker has provided Scotland and Fife with one of our most unique and exciting visitor attractions, and therefore I would like to join with colleagues in welcoming its reopening. Those before me have spoken at length about the uh, impressive refurbishment of the bunker but it's worth stating again just how substantial the structure is. It lies 300 feet below ground. Its entrance is hidden by a farmhouse, and the bunker is a vast labyrinth of tunnels covering an area the size of two football pitches. As part of a variety of improvements, visitors will now be able to see a remodeled British telecom room and specialist equipment needed to feed an astonishing 2,800 phone lines to the bunker. Formerly closed rooms are to be opened, and a number of information screens have been added, as well as an audio tour to improve the visitor experience. Now, tourism, as um, we've heard uh, uh, from uh, Alec Rowley, is a hugely important industry to Fife. In 2012, tourist expenditure in Fife was worth £313 million, contributing 6,000 full-time jobs, with 2.8 million people enjoying 6.1 million days in the area. And although famed for its castles, its fishing villages and golf courses, the secret bunker gives Fife, and particularly this area of Fife, another weapon in its armoury to attract visitors. Despite looking identical, almost identical today to when it was first opened, the role of the bunker has changed dramatically over the years. On its construction in 1951, the bunker operated as a military command centre and would have served as the base for the Scottish Government in the event of a nuclear attack. 
Now, for the post-Cold War generation, it's hard to imagine how close the world came to nuclear Armageddon in the 1960s. The Cuban Missile Crisis and the nuclear arms proliferation put the globe on the brink of all-out war. And to this end, Scotland played a key strategic role during the Cold War, welcoming US submarines to the noon. Recently declassified documents show that the UK government was preparing for nuclear attacks that would target Glasgow as the UK's second city, RAF Lossiemouth, and the Holy Loch Marine Base. As a result of this communist threat, a number of subterranean fortifications were built throughout Scotland, and many surviving to this day. But at the moment, the secret bunker in Fife is the only one to open as a visitor attraction. The Cold War forms a key part of the history curriculum at both National five, 4 and 5 level, and the secret bunker gives today's students the opportunity to witness firsthand some of the preparations made for war. I think it's worth reflecting on how fortunate we are that indeed the secret bunker never had to be used for its intended purpose uh, and the world survived that uh, worrying period in its history that was the Cold War uh, and we live, I hope, in happier times today. Beside the officer, Fife has many historic attractions but nothing quite like the secret bunker. Inside it, history comes alive and visitors are offered a distinct insight into the macabre world that was the Cold War. The bunker has huge importance to Fife's culture, economy and education, and I would like to join with others in wishing it success for the next 20 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now move to Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop for the closing speech. Again, Cabinet Secretary has seven minutes or thereby. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I also would congratulate Rod Campbell on bringing the debate and, and also for his and, and other informative contributions. And I also would want to add the Scottish Government's congratulations on Scotland's Secret Bunker reaching its milestone 20th anniversary as a tourism attraction. Uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in welcoming that the Secret Bunker, as Graham Day has pointed out, is now not so secret and is a key attraction attraction in the East Nuke of Fife, with Visit Scotland featuring it in their marketing of the area. And it's heartening that its original purpose as a place for government to continue in the event of a Soviet attack was never ever required. There have been a, a few references to the Cuban Missile Crisis, and for those interested in that period, they might be interested in the role of the Scot, uh, Paul Henderson Scott, who was serving in the British Embassy at the time he was on the the last plane, the last flight into Havana, and his account uh, during his autobiography is something that people may be interested in. But to take a, an abandoned uh, military bunker classified as secret until the end of the Cold War and to see the potential as an educational tool and visitor attraction illustrates the innovation, the ingenuity and the dedication that exists in Scotland that helps make the tourism industry as diverse and as welcoming as it is. And as uh, Parliament has noted, it is welcome that the owner, James Mitchell, has seen fit to further invest in upgrading the bunker as an important Cold War um, exhibit. Murder Fraser has pointed out that uh, not only have existing parts been refurbished, but access to this massive subterranean building increased to help visitors get a better feel of the important role that the building had uh, and to be grateful that it was never actually needed. We should also support Mr Mitchell in his endeavours to turn another bunker, one that would have been the ministerial headquarters located right here in Edinburgh, into a visitor attraction. I understand he's currently restoring the derelict bunker underneath Christophan Hill with plans to open it in 2016. And as we've mentioned, we all want to attract more visitors and Scotland has a unique appeal. The East Nuke of Fife, where the bunker sits, is a microcosm of the diversity that tourism in this country offers. From picturesque harbour villages, award-winning blue flag beaches, a wonderful natural larder and historic golf courses, emphasising Scotland's place as the home of golf. And there are also the various attractions that help tell the story of the area. As well as the bunker in the wider Fife area, uh, Scotland's fishing industry is celebrated at the Scottish Fisheries Museum in Anstruther, history through the National Trust Kelly Castle, uh, motorsport at the Creole race, uh, Raceway and as Alec Rowley has pointed out the fabulous Fife Coastal Pass linking all the communities together and he mentioned uh, the Loch Orr site in his own constituency. And Anstruther is also, as we know, uh, famous in, uh, for the award-winning fish and chips and Fife's uh, first artisan cheese, the Anster. And of course, these will be celebrated as part of 2015's Year of Food and Drink, which we'll be going into next year. And there are also, of course, impressive marinas servicing the growing popularity of yachting and marine tourism. 
And of course, nearby St Andrews in Rod Campbell's constituency has also played host to successful conferences. For example, a biblical literature conference held last year underlines the benefit from business tourism and is actively supported, was actively supported from the Visit Scotland Administered Conference Bid Fund. So the experiences that the East Duke offers uh, Scotland abounds in. Uh, in terms of our international visitor spend, it rose at 20% last year and generated almost £1.7 billion. Pounds. There were also 2.4 million visits to Scotland from overseas in 2013. That was a 9.8% increase up on 2012. And on a UK level, Scotland was in second place after London for total holiday spending. So you know, tourism is, is clearly a key economic sector for Scotland, and we recognise that the sector is an engine for growth and job creation. And of course, uh, Lonely Planet naming Scotland as one of the three top countries in the world to visit in 2014, enhancing our profile. But I thought the point from Alan Riley was absolutely correct that it's not just about visitors coming to the capital city in Edinburgh and uh, he singly missed out West Lothian when he talked about the wider area in terms of uh, capturing and encouraging tourists uh, to see a further effect. And of course tourism itself has a ripple effect in the opportunities to show, uh, showcase Scotland as a place to live, learn, invest, buy from and visit again. Uh, we value the sector uh, and we're working with the industry across a range of uh, issues to increase the attractiveness and competitiveness of the sector. It's a key employment sector, especially in rural areas, and nowhere is that, I think, I felt more keenly than in areas of Fife. And obviously, in terms of the impact, it's important there, as well as ensuring we have skills and uh, develop to encourage careers in tourism. And the East Nuke is also actively participating in Homecoming Scotland. The East Nuke Festival, at the end of this month, celebrates its 10th birthday with 10 days of music, literature, family events and art. And the festival will reach out to the world as international artists gather in this beautiful coastal spot. So this year is a great year for Scotland in terms of uh, homecoming, the Ryder Cup, Commonwealth Games, um, a huge range of, of different events taking place in terms of the contribution that, that it can make. And I would encourage every area, not only just to uh, celebrate the different events that are taking place now, um, as part of the year of homecoming, but to look ahead, as Fife is already doing, to the year of food and drink um, for architecture and design, and then the year in 2017, the year of heritage. So, in conclusion, attractions such as the Secret Bunker are an important part of the overall tourism patchwork. Not only do they celebrate and commemorate our history or culture, and they tell interesting stories that people uh, don't know about, and I think the one that the Secret Bunker um, suggests is one that's always attractive. And I think the point about children in particular always being interested in what is secret, um, I think is perhaps a marketing tool they can use. I remember being up on the, the, the London Eye uh, with, my, my, with my son, who was only about seven years at the time. They had a map of uh, everything that they could see from the top of the London Eye, and it was the MI5 offices that really excited them. So certainly, I think having, having an attraction called the Secret Bunker is one that can attract young boys in particular and their families. But obviously, in terms of the support for the wider sector, uh, tourism uh, benefits and generates £10 billion of economic activity in the wider uh, supply chain and it contributes £5 billion to Scottish DGP. And obviously, in terms of the secret bunker and its contribution to the local economy, that is something that we can stress as part of of this story, but it's also about the heritage and the culture and the unknown stories that need to be told. So further investment in the secret bunker and developments at Castorfin must be congratulated, and it also illustrates the willingness of the tourism industry, uh, James Mitchell in particular, to continue to grow a vital part of Scotland's economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I thank you all. I now close this meeting of Parliament.